What's going on everybody? We just kicked off a new series entitled Cruise Control. You know, the Bible speaks of a man by the name of Noah who found favor in the sight of God. God warns Noah that a flood is coming. Yet God instructs Noah to build an ark. But not only does God instruct Noah to build an ark, God sends people to assist Noah in navigating through his flood. I believe that there's some characteristics that we can learn from the story of Noah that will assist us in discerning who should be on our ark. I would encourage you to check out the message to get those notes. I also want to thank everyone who has been supporting us over the years, everyone who's liked, shared, and subscribed, and those who have joined Evangel Nation. Evangel Nation is the place to be. It allows you to stay updated with all of our current information, all of our conferences, so that you can be a part of what God is doing here in Greensboro, North Carolina, and all over the world. Again, I pray you're having a blessed day. Thank you for your support and your prayers. I'm going to pray that my God will continue to supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Until next time, keep rowing. Peace. Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. Home all by myself. Amen. I had plenty of time to seek the Lord. <laughs> Let's turn to Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. It reads something like this. It reads, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. I want to take a few moments just to talk from a subject title on today, just simply cruise control. If I had to give it a subtitle, I would give it a subtitle, Eight is Enough. Eight is enough. Cruise control, eight is enough. As you know, we are a disciple-making church. We made a big statement at the beginning of the year that this is the year that we connect with God, with others, and with purpose. And I realized that who you do life with controls the quality of your experience. And if we're going to define what a crew is, I want to just define a crew as anyone that God sends you to help navigate the storms of life. I don't know about you, but I feel like there's a lot of people that are going through their own private struggles and storms, and I believe it's necessary that you have a crew. Because when I look at the scriptures frequently, arcs, ships, and boats in the Bible encounter storms. Uh, if you know the story, this is the story of Noah. That the Bible says that God has strived with man, and because of man's rebellion, God says it grieved him so much that he wanted to start again. That's prophetic that if God can start again, you can start again as well. And the Bible says that even though God is grieved, there is a man by the name of Noah that finds favor. Yeah, that's an undeserved gift given to us in the person of Jesus Christ to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. It is favor. That means when God sides with the underdog, that is favor. And so no matter how much famine was taking place, there was favor. You know the story. God speaks to Noah and says, Noah... It's going to rain on your head. And you have to understand why this is so strange because Noah and the whole entire community had never seen a witness rain. So he's building something he's never built before for a day he's never seen before. I want you to know that this ark 
was a lifeboat, that this ark was built by God's plan. I want to remind you that if your ship is going to survive a storm, it is necessary that you confirm it's in God's plan. You understand that storms are going to come and they expose what your house is built upon. When we look at the scriptures, there's a house that is built upon the rock and the house that is built upon the sand. The house that's built upon the sand crumbles when the storm comes because many times the storm comes to test our foundations. But this ark that God instructs Noah to build is unique because this ark endures a flood. You have to understand the significance of a flood. A flood is what wipes your life out. It's what catches you off guard. It's what attempts to drown you. It's a flood. And watch this. The forecast of this particular flood is the result of another man's sin. It's really not Noah's fault that the flood is coming. Now, what happens when the storm you are in is not your fault? Let me preach to a few people because some of you are enduring a storm based upon associations, based upon people you are connected to. And we see that quite frequently throughout scripture because Jonah is in a storm that he caused, but the other sellers, his crew, have to endure the storm because of Jonah's disobedience. That's why you got to watch who you roll in with in this season. And let me say this, that this message is not just all about who you're rolling with, because one thing I realized is that if you're going to have right people in your crew, you got to make sure that you're the right person. Because right people attract right people. Very rarely will you see a wrong person attract the right type of people. This is why you keep on repeating some of the same mistakes over and over and over again. Because you have not been transformed by the renewing of your minds. So you're still attracted to what brings you harm. And it's not until God changes you and you become who he's made you to be that you can attract who you're supposed to be with. And so that's why it's important that we don't just examine if people are right around us, that we make sure that people are right on the inside of us. Because the Bible says all creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. Some people are waiting on you to get right so that they can find you because you're not quite who you will be. This is a prophetic moment. This is a moment of encouragement. This is why people shouldn't judge you prematurely because God's not through with you yet. They didn't like this, so let me preach to myself. This is why I have to have patience with myself because God is not through with me yet. I'm not the same man I was in 2015. God's not through with me. See, some people leave you in your developmental season because they think God is through with you. But the Bible says that we come out as pure gold because God is not through with us. Now, understand this, that this flood is designed to wipe you out. It's designed to flood you and drown you. Now, favor, watch this, does not exempt you from floods. Let me say that because some of you want to pray away floods. Some of you want to be on good behavior and think God's going to exempt you from floods. But favor does not exempt you from floods. Sometimes favor is revealed in the flood. Noah has favor, but Noah still has to go through the flood. This is just a fact of life. Now watch this. Noah... Again, it's going through the storm because somebody else sinned. And watch this. Noah very easily could have played the blame game. But instead of Noah being a blamer, Noah is a builder. Instead of Noah asking God, why me? Noah begins to construct something based upon the plans of God. 
And I want you to know some of us, we throw a pity party and a pity party keeps us in the same state. But I promise you that if God has you in a predicament, he has a plan. This is what Romans reminds us of, that all things work together for the good of them that love God. And watch this, that are called according to his purpose. Jeremiah reminds us that he knows the plans he has for us for good and not for evil. To give us a hope and an expected end. So even though I'm facing a flood, God has a plan. Why don't you encourage somebody to say, God has a plan. Because sometimes we don't know what we're going to do. We don't know the next step we're going to take. But the good news is that God has a plan. Can I preach like it's old school Sunday? While you're trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. I'm not going to go there because I wouldn't be able to get the service back. But the truth of the matter is, God has a plan. In your confusion, God has a plan. In what you feel to be a dead end, God has a plan. In your hurt, God has a plan. In your sorrow, God has a plan. In depression, God has a plan. I just came here to tell you that just because you're clueless doesn't mean God is without a plan. And sometimes we don't know what God knows. God has a plan. This is why the writer could say it was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes because God has a plan. And so just because I'm in the flood does not mean God does not have a plan. And sometimes his plan is not our plans. And our plans are not his plans. So Noah begins to build because sometimes floods are a prelude to a new beginning. Floods are God's means of resetting our lives. I know you don't think your life needs to reset, but sometimes God thinks you need a reset. He allows floods to allow us to reset. And I want to say this, um, that when you build the right thing, sometimes the thing you dread is the thing that's going to float your boat. Let me say it again. I said, the thing you dread is the thing, the thing that's going to float your boat. Watch this. An ark is unnecessary if there is no flood. An ark cannot float if there's no flood. And I want to submit this to you. When you're in an ark, you really don't steer the ark. You got to trust the captain of the ark to steer the ark. Sometimes it takes more faith just to stay afloat. Can I help some of you all? You know, I can swim a little bit enough not to drown, but I cannot float. Floating takes too much faith for me. You have to just stay still and trust the buoyancy of the water. See, that's where some of us are. We're expert swimmers, but we haven't learned how to float. And God said, in this season, in this flood, you got to learn how to float. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. You got to learn to stay afloat because you can't swim in the flood. You just have to float. Noah did not steer the ark. He just had to float and trust that God was going to take him to the destination he has willed for his life. And some of you, you're doing everything in your power just to stay afloat. In order to, in order to float, you got to stay calm. That's why I can't float. In order to float, you got to have peace. That's why I can't float. Some of you are sinking. Because in the flood, you can swim, and all you can do is float. When you trust, you put your weight, you put your life in God's hand. You sit on them. How many of us are expert swimmers, but we cannot float? But when you're in the flood, you have to float. And I know why we don't like floating. Because floating is uncomfortable. Because floating, you know, any second you can sink. 
floating reminds you that you're not in control. And so in this flood, Noah has to float. And most theologians would tell you that he floated for about an entire year. The rain lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood lasted for a year. What happens when you're in a season that seems like it'll never end? You know, I feel like I'm in a season where I just have to learn how to float. You, you ever become anxious for everything and you start choking yourself out and you start dealing with high blood pressure and all of these side effects that come as a result of not trusting God? And he said, all I call you to do for this season is float. You don't even have to swim. Because when God asks you to float, that means he's going to carry you. I came to prophesy to somebody um, that in this season you've been carrying, in last season you were carrying everybody else, but in this season, God's about to carry you. Can I prophesy to you? You're like, God, I'm tired of swimming. He said, I didn't ask you to swim. I just asked you to float. Some of us are losing sleep because we're trying to fight the waves. And all God is asking you to do is float. Because Noah could not steer the ark. He had to learn how to float. For a whole year, he had to float. They didn't have GPS. He had to learn how to float. Now, I love this. Because the thing we dread is the things that cause our boat to float. When you have an ark. Again, all things work together for the good when you have an ark. And watch this. We can't control the type of storms we face. But our crew influences our response. This is why it's important that you have the right crew. Because you can be on the right ship or boat or ark and not have the right crew. And it can change your experience. And watch this. Some crews emerge by choice and others, I was going to say chance, but I want to add to it and say by his choice. Some crews are developed by my choice and some crews are designed by his choice. There's some friends I pick for myself and there's some friends God picks for me. But the thing I love about this particular story is that everyone in this crew has a call. Yeah. So in this season, you don't need company without a calling. I think that's your problem. That's our problem is that we had company before that did not have a call. We dated people before that was not called to us because we were so lonely and we were tired of being alone and God said in this season you don't just need company you need the right type of company listen I'm not that lonely to be hanging out with people for decades that God never called to be with me because I'm not about just quantity I'm about quality and so now I need to discern whether or not you're called because no one enters the ark that was not called. And this is why we even join the church because the church is called the Ecclesia, which means the called out one. So you can't even come into the ark of the church without being called. And this is why the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Chosen people are people that responded to the call. So you got to ask people and you got to discern whether or not people's calling is to you. And that calling is to your life. You know, because many times your greatest miracle is disguised as a person and your greatest misery is disguised as a person. 
You're trying to find somebody and you're trying to get away from somebody else. Because the truth of the matter is, everyone is not created equally. And so you got to discern whether they're called to be with you. And then if they say they're called, you got to ask them who called you. Because everyone in the ark was called by God. And as my dad said so many years ago, it's that that right people left you. It's that wrong people stayed too long. You got to make sure people are called. Because I promise you, there's a difference between called people and people that just show up. I just need everybody that knows that you've been called to give God some glory right now. And if you can go a little step further, say, I'm not just called, Pastor. I'm chosen. I need you to write in the comments, I'm called. Now, my, my crew has to be called. My crew has to be called. Look at somebody say, my crew has to be called. My, my crew has to be called because I'm too old now to play around. My crew has to be called. Gang, I'm at the age now, I can just stay at home by myself and enjoy the weekend. I don't have to go anywhere. But if I'm going to hang out with you, we got to be called to be together. No, no, I'm, I'm not that lonely. I'm going beyond that because I understand people can give you heartache and heartbreak if they're not called to be with you. Because whoever can increase you will eventually decrease you. I've lived longer enough to know that. That's why I'm not anxious with every friend request I get. My question is, are you called? And can I see the calling on your life? Let me get out of here. Give me a few more minutes. Because all company is not created equal. Because evil communication corrupts good behavior. So you can ask yourself, the call. Now watch this. After we establish that your crew must be called, watch this, every crew, number one, has access. In other words, they have the ability to go in. Yeah, yeah, some people talk about it. And some people are about it. Look, understand in Noah's day, there were people that heard Noah preach. See, that's a whole other message. Because Noah didn't just have a sermon. Noah had a structure. It was not the sermon that saved the people alone. It was the structure. Can I preach to you, Evangel Fellowship? That's why we have to be different. We can't just preach sermons and not build structures. Because when the flood comes, the sermon alone won't save you if you haven't built a structure. This is why you got to handle your finances correctly. Because even though you proclaim the word of the Lord, if you don't save high and spend low, you're going to be wiped away like everybody else. Because you preach in a sermon, but you don't have a structure. This is why we can't say we're the disciple-making church and we don't create a structure to disciple people. Noah had more than just a sermon. He had a structure. Sometimes the reason you're failing is because all you have is words. But you don't have any structure. Because somebody said, I'm building something this year. I'm building something this year. Hope I didn't lose you because you just wanted a good sermon. What we're trying to create is structure. Let me say this for the evangel family. This is why we do Bible study differently now. Because I realize some of you would just be satisfied with a sermon. But when the flood comes, you get wiped out because you didn't have a structure. This is why you have to engage with people before you need them. Because when you need them, they may not answer their phone. So he that desires friends must first show himself friendly. That's why you feel like you're in isolation. That's why you feel like you're disconnected because you didn't connect with people in the sunshine because you didn't anticipate the rain coming. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. I'm coming for you today. I realized that in church so many times we preach things that people never walk in. But this crew was willing to go in. 
Yeah, they were willing to go in. Listen, there was only one door to go in because you got to send the ark is a picture of salvation, which reminds us that there's only one door to salvation. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the door. I believe this, that there are many ways to Jesus, but there's only one way to the Father. And that way is the Son. And you got to walk through the door. I'm praying this, that in this season, God will open up a door so big, my whole crew can get through. I came in to prophesy to somebody that you've been looking for a whole lot of doors, but all you need is one door. And this door can outweigh all the other doors because it's big enough for you, your mama, your cousin, your grandma, everybody to walk through at the same time. Can I just get some unselfish people to say, God, open up a big door this year. This ark only had one door. Some of y'all mad because all these little doors are not opening. But God says, I'm going to give you quality this year and not just quantity. I'm going to open up a big door. There's only one door in the ark. and Everybody walked through. So you got to have a crew that says, we're not going to just be hearers of the word. But we're going in. We're not going to just be hearers and not doers. We're going in. Because I'm tired of people that are talking about what they're about to do, what they finna do. I'd rather hang out with some lepers that say, why sit we here until we die? We've got to bust the move for the kingdom of God. We about to have revival. We finna have revival. Where are we going to have it? I need some friends that say, I am revival. Revival lives in me. Secondly, they have that access, which is to go in. They need to have assignment, which is to pitch in. Yeah, yeah. See this boat right here? That's a rowboat. That's why it has paddles. But there's some people that just take up seats. And are passengers. And they're not crew members. A crew member has an assignment in your life. They're not just there to enjoy the ride. They help you to get to your destination. Even if it means rubbing you the wrong way. Because iron sharpens iron. I thank God for all of my friends, all of my crew members that wouldn't let me settle for less than God's best. I want to send you a love letter and thank you from the bottom of my heart. And so what you got to know is that when you're rolling with the crew, your assignments have got to be clear. They got to be clear. Let me talk to couples. You can be married and not be clear on assignments. That's why you have a mountain of laundry in the laundry room because no one knows who's going to wash them. And the Holy Spirit said, I would if I could, but I can't. Only flesh can wash. You got to be clear on assignments. Whose responsibility is it to pay the bills? That's why your lights get cut off because nobody knew their assignment. And this year, you got to be clear on your assignment. That's one of the things that this church is doing is helping people find their place so they can do their part. Because you don't want to be in a crew that doesn't have an assignment. Everyone on Noah's boat had an assignment. They understood I had an assignment on this ark. But when I get off, the reason me and my wife are on this ark is because God is depending on us to reproduce after the flood is over. So we're clear on our assignment. Look at somebody say, this year you got to be clear on your assignment. You don't want to be on a boat. Just joyriding because the purpose 
of the boat, the purpose of the ship, the purpose of the ark is to take you to a destination, but it requires your participation. To be clear on your assignment. But to be clear on your assignment. On your assignment. This is what the Evangel Nation community is about. It's helping people find their assignment. I could preach a message, but I'm trying to help you walk in your assignment. Because when you get older like me, some of y'all laughing, but I've been pastor for 15 years. Fifteen years is a long time. I'm at the point now, I don't even know if I want people on the boat that can't find their assignment. Because watch this. If they don't know their assignment, they'll interfere with yours. That's why I have a passion for helping people to find their assignment. And your assignment is not to be decided. It's to be discovered. So, you got to find your assignment. Let me move. I'm getting out your way. Taking too long. And your assignment is based upon your unique ability. There's something you can do that only you can do. Right? And God has specially equipped you to fulfill that assignment. I want to submit to the reason, in some cases, my anointing has increased because my focus has. When you know what you're called to do, you know what you're not called to do. If you're called to sing soprano, you know you're not called to sing tenor. <laughs> then apprehension. 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 Can I say this? When you walk in your assignment, not only do you recognize it, but everybody recognizes it around you. Apprehension. This thing I love about God. The crew, Noah's crew, they get on the ark. They get on the ark. Right? All the animals come two by two. Even the snail gets on the ark. That means the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong. <laughs> but the one that's consistent. That's why some people tried to count you out, but you remain persistent. And you made it to your destination. But the Bible says as soon as everybody gets on the ark, that God does something very significant. He shuts the door. Watch this behind them. Now, now we preach messages about how God shuts doors in front of us. And some of us are frustrated right now because it seems like God has shut a door in front of us. But what happens and why does God shut doors Behind us. Because let's be honest. Some of us have a temptation. To return. Some of us when life gets so hard. We want to go back. To who we were. And what we were doing. And so because the ark. Is a type of salvation. Just like Paul says. I'm going to apprehend that which apprehended me. There's some doors God shuts. And seals. So that you can't go back. Can I preach to about two or three people? Some of you know, like I know, when God's hand is on your life, there's some places you can't go back to. Pastor, how do you know you can't go back to when God's hand is on your life? Because I tried to go back. 
Y'all looking at me funny like you haven't tried to go back to some places that God delivered you from and you realize when you tried to go back that the door was shut because God's hand is on your life. Look at somebody say, I refuse to go back. There's some relationships you picked up the phone and tried to call them, but God wouldn't even let them answer your phone call. God let the number be disconnected because God didn't want you to reconnect with your past because he was trying to bring you into a future. I thank God for every door he shut behind me. Some of you were trying to go back into some addictions, but when you tried to call your connect, your connect had relocated because God knows how to shut some doors behind you. Some of you are about to watch some stuff on TV that you weren't supposed to watch, but God allowed a storm to knock out your cable so you couldn't go back to where God delivered you. Y'all don't serve the type of God I serve. I'm here today because of the grace of God. It's really no goodness of my own. If you know God has ever shut a door for you, I need you to give God some praise. Because some people look at your life and think the reason you on good behavior is because you made good decisions. No, God shut the door so I wouldn't act like the fool that was on the inside of me. I serve a God that will look out for you even when you don't look out for yourself. So I'm here today all because he kept me. I'm alive today only because of his grace. Anybody got that testimony? He shuts the door behind you. Can I prophesy to somebody? Somebody has been this close to going back, but the devil is a liar. You can't go back. I prophesy that God will shut every door that's detrimental to your life. We rebuke the assignment, the attack, even the snares of the enemy, and you will live and not die and proclaim the work of the Lord. I came to prophesy to you, you're going to be like the Apostle Paul and forget those things that are behind you and press towards the mark because God is shutting doors. I tell you just to look at Satan if Satan is in this room and say this, say I won't be back. Come on, I need to hear you church, say I won't be back. I may fall, but I won't be back. I might make some mistakes, but I won't be back. Because thanks be to God that always causes us to triumph. Some of y'all don't have the same type of salvation I have. God will shut doors. There's some people I want to hook up with, but God wouldn't let them hook up with me because he knows how to shut doors behind you. Some of y'all were creeping, but nobody was out. So you went back home because God knows how to shut doors. I think we can give God another 20 second praise break just for every door. I typed the text, but he wouldn't let me see it. I thank God. Look at somebody say, I thank God. We could just go on that note. I say, I thank God. I need a crew in this season that's locked in. Say, this year we locked in. Now, we're not going to have one foot in here and one foot over here. No, we locked in this year. God's not asking you to be perfect. He's just asking you to be locked in. Are y'all hearing me? God's not asking you to be perfect. He's just asking you to be locked. You know what? I've experienced times that he kept me when I didn't want to be kept. That's when I realized it was a greater power operating in my life. Some of you that feel like you got worse testimonies than other people, you don't realize they wanted the same testimony you had. But God wouldn't allow them to have the same testimony because it wasn't necessary for their destiny. And they would have aborted the call on their life. 
Some of you should have had a worse testimony than you have. But God 